Harbinger by Rabbi Jonathan Kahn. Who's heard of this book before? Put up your hand. Yeah, hands all over the building. And I get asked about this all the time. What do you think about the Harbinger? What do you think about this guy, Rabbi Jonathan Kahn? And this guy was exalted lately in the, in the media and all over Facebook. Listen to this guy's great speech where he's preaching about Jesus and this and that. And you know, he's doing it in Washington DC in the belly of the beast. And, and you know, they'll send you some video of this guy preaching at the presidential prayer breakfast. And tell you, wow, he's really ripping some face at that presidential prayer breakfast. Let me explain something to you. Anybody who's invited to the presidential prayer breakfast is a false prophet. If he was really saying something that the powers that be didn't want to be said, he wouldn't even be invited. He wouldn't even be there. Now, let me just prove to you in five seconds that Jonathan Kahn is a lying false teacher. Okay? Ready to start the clock? Give me five seconds. Ready? Okay. Rabbi Jonathan Kahn. Done. Finished. Because Jesus Christ clearly said in Matthew 23, Be not ye called rabbi. That's what Jesus said in Matthew 23. Listen, anybody who calls themselves rabbi is not following Jesus. Period. End of story. Case closed. Done. Because you can't be following Jesus and say, oh yeah, I'm a preacher and a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ and say, hi, my name's Rabbi Jonathan Kahn. Doesn't work that way, friend, because Jesus commanded, be not ye called rabbi. He said, call no man father. And he said, be not ye called rabbi, be not ye called masters, okay? Now, why would anyone want to call themselves rabbi? Hmm, I think it starts with a P. What's that word that starts with a P again? Pride. Pride, that's what it is. Yeah, that's why someone would want to call themselves rabbi. But they say, oh, but man, this guy's teaching all this great stuff. He's got this book, The Harbinger, and it's just amazing. Let me just debunk for you this book, The Harbinger. Basically, this Harbinger book, it talks about all these mystical mysteries and signs where God prophesied this stuff in Isaiah chapter 9 and it's being fulfilled in America to the T and this ancient mystery unlocks the keys to America's judgment and America's future. Now, I can see why people would fall for it because he does make what seems to be a convincing case for one aspect of this. He has these nine harbingers that he associates with 9-11, okay? Now, first of all, in order to believe in this book, The Harbinger by Jonathan Kahn, you'd have to actually believe the official version on 9-11. Okay, so strike one, you're called rabbi. Strike two, you're telling us that God revealed all this stuff to you, but somehow God forgot to reveal to you that 9-11 was an inside job, okay? <laughs> you know, but, but, but here's the thing about that, okay? He has these nine harbingers that he lists, right? And basically he's saying, these, there's no way these things could be coincidences. They all line up perfectly with Isaiah chapter nine, verse 10. And this is God sending us this signal. And 9-11 was this judgment from God. And you know, we've got to change our ways, X, Y, and Z. So here's the thing. If you look at these harbingers, only one of them is even interesting because the rest of them are just clearly coincidences. He's just kind of twisting things and exaggerating things. Like for example, he says, uh, and if you would look at Isaiah chapter 9, verse 10, the bricks are falling down, but we'll build them with hewn stones. The sycamores are cut down, but he, we'll, we'll change them into cedars. He'll take that verse where it says, the sycamores are cut down, but we'll change them into cedars. And he makes this big deal about how there was this tree near ground zero at, at New York, and it was a sycamore tree. And when the buildings came down and crashed and debris flying everywhere. It destroyed this sycamore tree. And guess what they replaced it with? But the amazing thing, the uncanny thing, the very strange thing, but the precise thing is that on 9-11, strange thing happens. As the last tower is falling, it sends wreckage, beams into the air and the objects go across and hit an object that is a tree. The 
tree crashes. What kind of tree is it? It was a sycamore. Now, if they would have replaced it with a cedar tree, then that might actually make you think, oh, that's kind of interesting, right? Except it's not, they didn't replace it with a cedar tree. <laughs> they replaced it with like a coniferous evergreen type tree. But this is what he said. Oh, but if you go back to the Hebrew, the Hebrew word for cedar is kind of sort of similar in the same family of that type of tree. The people of Israel clear away the fallen sycamores. They go to the, to plant a cedar in the place, in the exact place where the sycamore has stood. Now what tree is it? Now when you read in English, you read cedar, but behind that is a Hebrew word. The Hebrew word is Erez, or the Erez tree. Erez can mean cedar, but it, it specifically means more than cedar. But it's so funny listening to him talk about it, because he says, you know, I mean, this is a city, it's concrete everywhere, it's buildings everywhere, what are the chances that this tree is gonna be there? Okay, listen, have you ever been to a city with no trees in it? Because every city in America, every city in the world is filled with trees. Hello. You know what, I, in fact, I got the proof. I busted out a window in the church van by accident, parking in downtown Phoenix because a tree branch went through the window in downtown. Now, what was a tree doing in downtown Phoenix? Somebody explain that to me. Uh, how about this? Because we live in the city right now. Look out the window. We don't exactly live in a jungle or rainforest. I mean, we're in the city. Do you see all those trees? Because guess what? Every street, every city, every high rise area. I mean, go to Phoenix and it's just rows of trees up and down every street, true or false. And if we went to New York, guess what we're gonna see? Trees. So that's not really that weird, especially since it's not even replaced with the same tree. That's two of his nine harbingers. Cause he splits it into two. One harbinger is that a sycamore tree got knocked down. I wonder how many other trees got knocked down when three buildings collapse and send debris flying everywhere. I'm sure many trees were destroyed. And then he's like, well, it's not even the same kind of sycamore, but you know, close enough. So a tree got knocked down and you're not gonna believe this. They planted a new one. Case closed. Okay, so that's two, but all the harbingers are like that. They're just dumb coincidences. Hey, they took a block from the old building and used it in the new one. Oh, shock. But, Here's the one that kind of gets everybody's attention as just, wow, this is so eerie. There's no way it could be a coincidence. He points out the fact that the Senate Majority Leader at the time, Tom Daschle, gets up and makes a speech the next day after 9-11, right? He gets up and makes a speech and he says, you know, uh, at times like this, the words of Isaiah speak to us when it says, and then he basically quotes Isaiah 9, 10, the bricks are falling down, but we'll build with hewn stones. The sycamores are cut down, but we'll change them into cedars. So basically he takes this passage about people defying God and he uses it in his speech as like, yeah, this is gonna comfort us right now. Now that is creepy and weird, isn't it? Yeah. Why would a politician get up and take a verse about defying God and say, you know what, we're gonna take comfort in this right now, and then just like publicly defy God. Okay, well all that proves is that our leaders don't know the Bible, yeah. or are just openly defying God. Do either of those things really surprise you? You don't really have to be a clairvoyant or a Kabbalist or into Jewish mysticism to figure that out, okay? But he basically used this defiant speech. And then three years later, another politician, Jonathan Edwards, fellow Democrat, quoted the same thing. You know, probably just getting it from the other guy who quoted it. So here's what this Jonathan Kahn says, this rabbi, quote unquote. He says, well, that's just a really weird coincidence because of all the 31,000 verses in the Bible, why would he pick this verse? It makes absolutely no sense to pick this verse that's just total defiance of God and has nothing to do with the situation. So therefore, everything in my 300 and some page book is true. Okay, but here's the thing. Actually, it makes perfect sense why Jonathan Edwards and Tom Daschle would have chosen this misguided scripture that has nothing to do with, you know, God just made them do it to fulfill this harbinger, you know? Well, here's the one-year Bible. Who has one of these? If you, if you have one of these or you've seen these, 
first of all, it says on the back that millions of people have benefited from this thing. So it's a, it's a, it's a hot selling item. I mean, I've seen this at tons of bookstores. We have like five of these at our house. We like this in our family, a lot of, a lot of our kids and stuff. They use this as their Bible reading, okay? So this is a real popular book that millions of copies have been sold. Well, if you turn to September 11th in the One Year Bible, and there are other Bible reading plans that would follow this same plan, if you go to September 11th in the One Year Bible, guess what passage it has you read that day? Isaiah chapter 9, verse 10. So it's like, oh, what, what? This is so crazy of a coincidence. I mean, of all the passages in the Bible, why would you pick Isaiah 9? Are you nuts? Well, maybe here's why. Because it was in the Bible reading for that day of millions of people who own this book. So obviously one of these people who wasn't very smart or several of these people who weren't very smart were reading their Bible on September 11th or maybe they don't even read their Bible that much, but they're scared, you know, because they don't know what's going to happen. So they grab the one year Bible off the shelf and they're like, okay, let's read today's portion. And in millions of people's Bible, right next to September 11th, it has this verse. So maybe one of them sent it to Tom Daschle and said, hey, here's a great, I was just reading this today. Here's a great verse. Or sent it to his staff or speech writers or whatever. People email these people all the time. So it's not just this amazing, insane, supernatural coincidence that Tom Daschle just happened to be led by God to read this obscure verse. No, it was the Bible reading for that day for millions of people who own this book. So it's really not, does, it, does anybody not understand what I just said? Because I want to make sure everybody understands what I just said. And basically that's the only thing that's compelling at all of these harbingers. The rest are just silly coincidences or he has to go back to the Hebrew and twist words and make it say things that aren't even really there. And this book is this guy's claim to fame that he solved this amazing mystery of the harbor. And then he's got all these other books that he's coming out with now. And listen, this guy is teaching these heresy and lies of the Hebrew roots movement. Yeah. This Judaizing of Christianity and he puts a blanket over his head and you know, Hachflam and all this stuff where they, you know what I mean? That weird shawl they put over their head and it's gonna give me power. And uh, you know, you feel the, feel the spirit and everything. He teaches all this Jewish stuff, Jewish fables. And this messianic, and listen, when people talk about messianic Judaism, it's 1% messianic, 99% Judaism. It's real heavy on Judaism. You know, we don't need messianic Judaism. You know, we need Christianity. You know, we need Jesus, the New Testament, the gospel. But this Zionist, this rabid Zionist, Jonathan Kahn, with his pro-Jewish, pro-Israel, pro-Judaism, Judeo-Christian teaching, right? He comes out with one cute thing, and then all of a sudden everybody wants to listen to this guy. Why do they want to listen to him? Well, because he found this amazing coincidence that Tom Daschle quoted a verse that didn't make any sense. Look. Anybody who listened to Tom Daschle and would have looked that up in their Bible would have said, hey, that verse that he read makes no sense to read because it's a verse about people defying God. But really, is that weird that some Democrat senator majority leader didn't know the Bible real well and quoted an irrelevant verse? I mean, that reminds me of when Bill Clinton said, hey, my, you know, my favorite verse is John 16, 3. Oh, man. You know what I mean? It's like, he, obviously we all know he meant John 3, 16 but he's so biblically illiterate that he said, hey, it's, it's, it's John 16, three is my favorite verse. You know, th what, what difference is that from Tom Daschle just quoting somebody, somebody sent him, cause they were reading it in their one year Bible, okay? And then they said, oh yeah, this is a great relevant verse. He's like, okay, doesn't read the context. He just reads that verse by itself, quotes it in a speech, so now we're gonna go on a tour of New York with Rabbi Jonathan Kahn and his modern day prophets and they're having all these dreams and visions where George Washington and King Solomon are like the same guy and everything, you know, uh, they're, they're like parallels and all, you know, just making up all this weird stuff based on Tom Dash will quote in a stupid verse that came from the one year Bible for that day, somebody sent it to him or whatever. Look, the book is a fraud. 
The guy is a fraud. The guy's a gimmick. And I'm sorry, I just don't get that excited that some pastor goes to a presidential prayer breakfast and says, hey, you need to be saved through Jesus. Yeah, we need Jesus. You know what? There are all kinds of phony lying preachers who will get up and say, hey, we need Jesus. Hey, Jesus saves. Yeah. Benny Hinn will tell you that. <laughs> Kenneth Copeland will tell you that. I mean, look, people will say all kinds. Not everybody who says, Lord, Lord, right. you know, is going to enter the kingdom of heaven, people. So don't be deceived by this guy. This guy is teaching a bunch of Jewish fables. He's a Judaizer. You say, well, I don't know if you're right, Pastor Anderson. No, you don't know if Jesus is right. When Jesus said, be not ye called rabbi. Right. Done. See, I just wasted the last five minutes of my time because I, I could have just finished there. We could have just said, be not ye called rabbi. He calls himself rabbi. Therefore, he's a liar when he says, oh, I'm following Christ. He's my final authority. No, he's not. You are saying rabbi because you're pandering to a wicked religion called Judaism. And by the way, don't ever come at me with this thing of Jesus was a rabbi. Jesus was a rabbi. No, Jesus is the rabbi. He's the only rabbi. And he said, don't you be called rabbi. For what is your master? Christ. Amen. There, there's one rabbi. It's Jesus. But I wouldn't even use the word rabbi today to talk about Jesus because the word rabbi has come to mean something different now to where it's only associated with the Pharisees. The Pharisees are the only people who call themselves rabbi anymore. So, you know, we should not take on that Pharisee title. But when you're trying to work toward the Antichrist goal of merging Judaism and Christianity, 